subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello and you're welcome once again to your Joy Learning channel. This is SHS Hour with me, Dennis Amoba. This is our English class and as you always know, when we are here together, then we're going to learn some English at the SHS level. We have done many things, one of which is clauses. Today we're going to look at a topic, nominal clauses. And before we can do well, with this, or before we be able to identify nominal clauses, we have to go through some objectives. I know that any time we meet, we have some objectives we must achieve. So by the end of this interaction, we should be able to identify structures that are clauses. What are clauses and what structures are not clauses? So we'll be able to identify what clauses are. Then we will be able to identify structures that are referred to as nominal clauses. So we should be able to identify nominal clauses. And then we will try to use nominal clauses in sentences. What are they? What are nominal clauses at all? Before we be able to do this, let's look at these. And then we identify nominal clauses in given sentences and state their functions. It means that these nominal clauses perform certain functions and we will find sentences and we try to identify these nominal clauses and state their functions. If you're ready, we can begin. So we say, what is a clause? We have done this before. What is a clause? We say a clause has a subject and a finite verb. What do we mean when we say something is a subject. We have done that before. When we have, for instance, a simple sentence like Kofi has a lot of friends. Okay, Kofi has a lot of friends. What we called a subject is that structure which comes before the verb. Here, what is our verb? Our verb is has. So from has, once we have found has, then our subject is kofi. And has is the verb. And this verb is present. We said that a clause must have a subject and a finite verb. The verb there is has. What do we mean by a finite verb? We also learned that when we say a verb is finite, it simply means that the verb is either present or past. So when we say a finite verb, we are referring to the present or the past form of a verb. So for instance, the verb has comes from the verb to have. So I have have. Under the verb to have, we have have, which is I have, you have, we have, they have. And then we can have the other form of it, which is has. So he has, she has, my mother has, my friend has. And the past form of both have and has is had. Had. So I have money, you have money, we have money, they have money. She has money, my mother has money, he has money and the past tense of both have and has is had. These three forms of the verb to have are what we call the finite forms. So when we say that we want the finite forms of any verb, then we are referring to the present form, the third person form of it, and then the past form of that verb. We can go ahead and see a verb like see. Under see, we will have see, I see, you see, we see, they see. And then I can have the third person form will be she sees, Abina sees, Na sees. Okay, and then the past of the two, I see, you see, Na sees, my mother sees, your friend sees, will be saw. 
So when I say find the finite forms of the verb C, you have three of them. C, C's, and so. So when we say a clause is a group of, a group of words that has a subject and a finite verb, we are essentially <clears throat> just saying that that structure has the subject position is usually occupied by nouns, has a subject which is usually a noun and a verb which is either present or past. So kofi is a subject, the verb is has. Okay, and a lot of money gives you one idea. E beginning the structure, so that is a noun phrase in this sense is the object. We have done all of these. What we are interested in is our ability to identify the verb which is finite, present or past, and the subject. That is what will help us to identify what a clause is. I hope we get this. Great. So let's see what can be done quickly so that we look at the other f structures we have here and then we will go ahead steadily to learn what we have today, which of course is the nominal clause, but we must know what a clause is. I had to review because somebody might be watching me for the first time and the person must get a sense of what a clause is. So that when I say identify the clauses in the following sentences, you wouldn't be found wanted. That done, we can now go and look at the other forms. So I have some sentences say which of the following are clauses based on the explanation I've given you. I have my parents have a large palm plantation. Is it a clause? Okay. During the final march, that's another structure. We also have in spite of the rain, is it a clause? Abu et all the rice. Is this also a clause? This structure a clause. We have four structures there. Look at them carefully based on our, our understanding of what a clause is and identify whether they are clauses or not. Let's look at another sentence. Now made a passionate appeal to the Minister of, for Education, to the Minister for Education. Now made a passionate appeal to the Minister for Education. And then we have, when the ladies came home, which of these are clauses? Let's examine them. My parents or my parents have a large palm plantation. Where's the verb? Great, have is the verb. And it is present, right? And what's our subject? My parents. Therefore, this is a clause because there is a subject and a finite verb, which is have. The subject is my parents. We have learned that. That is also called a noun phrase. It's a possessive determiner, which is my, and a noun parent. So they form the noun phrase. And they are the subject position because we have found our verb, which is have. There is a relationship between them. Because we have my parents, we use have. We can't use has because my parents is plural. And we say they have a large palm plantation. Good. During the final march, during, that is a preposition, there is a determiner, final adjective, and march now. There is no verb in it. Therefore, that is not a clause. Think it's a prepositional phrase because it's headed by preposition during. In spite of the rain, in spite of, not written together, you know, that is a complex preposition. We have done prepositions before. And then you have a determiner, there and rain. So in spite of is a preposition, there determiner, rain, now. That is also not a clause. I hope you are following. Then we come to Abu et al. the rice. Do we have a verb there? Yes, we do. That is et. Therefore, Abu is our subject. And because we have a verb which is in the past, the original form is eat. The past form of eat is et. And we have said that final verb is 
the form of the verb, which is either present or past. So this is a final verb, et, and we have our subject, abu. So the whole structure is a clause. Great. And then we have now made a passionate appeal to the Minister for Education. Do we have a verb in there? Yes, we have. That is made. And now is our subject. So that is also a clause. Right? And then we have when the ladies came home. Do you have a verb in it? Yes, we do. What's that? Came. So came is the past form of come. And the other form is comes. So those three form the finite forms of the verb come. So came is finite. And our subject is the ladies. The when here will be used later. That is a subordinate conjunction, which indicates time. When the ladies came home. So that's it. Now we see those that are clauses. We have the first one, my parents have a large plantation farm. It is a clause because there is a subject, my parents, and the verb have, which is finite. And then we have abu et all the rice, which is also a clause because it has the finite verb et and then the subject abu. Now made a passionate appeal to the Minister for Education. Therefore, it is also a clause because made is the verb. Past tense form of make. And our subject is now, therefore, that is a clause. And then we have when the ladies came home, came is the verb. And the ladies is the subject. Therefore, that is also a clause. So we will be able to identify clauses wherever we find them, right? Good. Now that we can do that, let's look at this. Our clause will still be there to guide us. Kudus or Kudus has scored many goals. Is that a clause? Yes. Why is it a clause? There is a verb. As a verb group is there, has scored. Our finite form of that verb phrase is has, and that's the verb phrase has caught. But the finite part of it is the has, and it agrees with kudus, which is the subject. There's some subject-verb agreement. We have done all of that. The relationship or the agreement that exists between the verb and the subject. Okay, and we have said that from the verb to the end, the last word is the predicate. And the subject is that now which agrees with the predicate. Okay, here we have two verbs. One we call the auxiliary verb. You remember we have done that. And the lexical verb, which is the squad, what you sometimes call the main verb. So that is also a clause. Great. And then we have another. Ochebia loves chicken. What is our verb? Loves. So that is also a clause because the subject is Ochebia. This is our verb. And loves is the present form of love, which is the third person. Because Ochebia can be she. She loves chicken. That's a clause. So Kudis is our subject. The verb is has caught. And then we go to the next one. Mrs. Velvet Anturi is a great teacher. Mrs. Velvet Anturi is a great teacher. What is our verb? Our verb is is. Good. So our subject is Mrs. Velvet Anturi. Subject. This is our verb. Okay. This is our subject. Therefore, this is a clause. Why? Because is is the present form of the verb to be which is singular okay so he is she is it is All right and then we have this all the ladies paid their dues all the ladies paid their dues what's our verb paid good and then all the ladies becomes our subject 
Okay, that's our subject. This is our verb. But from the verb paid to the end, we say it is called the predicate. Don't forget that. But we are just interested in the subject and the verb, which is either present or past. At the SHS level, we define a clause or we explain what a clause is as a group that has a subject and a finite verb. And we have explained that the finite verb is that form of the verb which is either present or past. So let's look at these sentences and, and see the clause is still our guiding principle. And we say that there's another structure that does or perform the same functions as nouns do. So let's look at these sentences. Like, that Kudus scored a goal was not a surprise. That Kudus scored a goal was not a surprise. Let's look at them. And then we say that Messi will be selected is certain. That Messi will be selected is certain. Then we have that you have come home early today is good. That you have come home early today is good. And we have that we lost the debate was intriguing. That we lost the debate was intriguing. We are saying that we have a structure. In English, if you can observe, they all begin with that, that. That does the work of nouns or what nouns do. If you would remember, we have to go back and let me explain something to you. We noticed that Kudus has scored many goals. You notice Kudus is a noun. A name of a player we all know and he is the subject or the name Kudus is the subject because our verb has scored has come and therefore on the left side of has scored is the subject and that position is occupied by the noun Kudus we go to the next one we have Ochebia loves chicken and Ochebia is a noun, and it occupies the position of the, the subject, okay? The subject position is occupied by the noun Ochebia. Once we have found our verb to be is in the third example, we see another noun, Mrs. Velvet Antiri. It's also a noun, and it's at the subject position. You have all the ladies paid their dues. What's our verb? Paid. And we said all the ladies is a noun phrase. So that position, the subject position, is occupied by all the ladies, which forms a noun phrase. This position, which is occupied by nouns, can also be occupied by another structure. There is a structure that can perform all the functions that nouns perform. So if you look at this, for instance, after the verb has scored, we see many goals. There too we have the noun, goals. And many is the determiner. That position is occupied by a noun, which is the subject position is occupied by the noun, many goals. We can also say Ochebia loves chicken. What does Ochebia love? Chicken. That position is also occupied by a noun. And what, if you remember, we learned subject, verb, object, complement, and all. We learned, if you remember, that subject positions are usually occupied by nouns. And object positions are occupied by nouns like Ochebia loves chicken. We said that if it's an object, we could also try and passivize a structure. Chicken is loved by Ochebia. If you can passivize the structure, then that noun is 
the object. We talked about transitive verbs and intransitive verbs. We said that transitive verbs were verbs that needed nouns to make the action of the verb complete. If you just say Oshibia loves, we would ask you what does she love? That what which makes the action of the verb or the verb complete or completes the sense of the verb loves is what we call object. So we see kudus has caught. Somebody will ask you what? That what, which is the now, is the object. The girl slapped. You want to find out where the slap went to or who was affected by the slap. So the girl slapped the boy. The boy is the recipient or is the one who receives the action. Okay, that which receives the action or makes the action complete is what we call the object. And it's usually a noun. So nouns occupy the positions of subject and object, and then complement. Here we have seen that kudos is a noun and it's at the subject position. Many goals now is at the object position. What we are saying is that there is another structure which can also occupy the position of the subject or the position that nouns occupy. So we have our verb, was and not to be together. So the verb here is was, okay? And the whole of this, that could have scored a goal. Do we have a verb in it? Yes, scored. And then kudus is the subject. So we have a subject and a verb. What it tells us from the outset or what we have at the top that a clause has a subject and a finite verb. Scored is a verb which is also finite. Why? Because it is the past form of score. And our subject is kudus. Therefore, that could have scored a goal as a clause. Have we seen that? It is a clause. Why? Because there's a subject and a finite verb. Good. Let's look at another one. We have that mercy will be selected is certain. Is that also a clause? Yes. Why? Because you have the structure will be selected as your verb phrase, verb. And messy is our subject. So that's also a clause. Our verb, main verb in the sentence is is. The other one is was. And once we find that verb, okay, we find that verb, that structure and the line on the left becomes the subject. And it occupies the positions that nouns occupy. And because it has sort of nominated itself to do the work of a noun, it is called a nominal clause. So a nominal clause is any structure that has a subject and a final verb and does what a noun does or performs a function and now performs. And we can see that once we find our verb was, that could have called a go was not a surprise. That whole structure, that could have called a go, can be replaced with a pronoun. Because wherever nouns are, we can use pronouns to replace them. Because pronouns are essentially words that are used in place of nouns to avoid repeating the nouns. So in this sense, that could have scored a goal was not a surprise. Can we say he was not a surprise? No, it means it's, kudus is not the most important word there. And you can say that was not a surprise, yes. But you can say scored was not a surprise. So that whole structure is together. They are headed by the subordinate conjunction that. You see that that too here, that messy will be selected certain they are the, the structures that have that as the, the clause head. We call that one the subordinate conjunction. So that whole structure is one, okay? And 
because you don't have any one word there which we will depend on to, to uh, write a pronoun, we take that whole structure as some idea. And so if it's an idea, it's not a human being, we don't have a particular noun there, so we can replace the idea with the neuter it. So you can replace the whole structure that could have scored a goal with it. And you say, it was not a surprise. And somebody asks you, what was not a surprise? Then you say, that could have scored a goal. And you can say that Messi will be selected is certain. You can say it is certain. And they ask you, what is certain? Oh, that Messi will be selected as a player of the tournament. Okay, so that is what we are talking about here. Let's look at another structure. You have that you have come home early is good. Let's look at the word, the structure underlined, that you have come home early. Do you get the sense of what we are talking about? Can we use our pronoun to replace it? It? Yes. So we can say, it is good. And then somebody asks you, what is good? Oh, that you have come home early. Is that a phrase or a clause? There is a clause because you have have come, which is our verb, and you, which is the subject. So that is a clause. We have said the verb should be finite. Have is the present form of have, the verb to have. So we have have, has, and then had. So have is the auxiliary here. The main or the lexical verb is come. But the finiteness is seen on the auxiliary verb. Okay, so you have come. That you have come home. And I see the whole structure, the main verb there is the verb is, and so we can say, it is good, it is good. So what we see is that the main sentence essentially is, it is good, but there is a part of the sentence which is a clause. What can we establish here? We can establish that the nominal clause, what we call a nominal clause, it is part of a sentence. Okay, it is a sentence element. As it were, if you were looking at S-V-O-C, then the S-V-O-C-A, here we see our verb as is, and the whole other structure, the that structure, is the subject. And therefore, it is a part of a sentence. And that part where the nominal clause has occupied is the subject position. And it is a position that is occupied by nouns. And we have said that once that position is occupied by nouns, and this is a clause, then we call it a noun clause. Don't forget that. It is a clause because it has a subject and a finite verb, and it is introduced by the subordinate conjunction that. So many times some people call the that clause, which functions as a noun. Don't forget that. Let's see whether we have other examples. We have that we lost a debate was intriguing. So when you go to any text and this sort of structure has been underlined, take your time and ask yourself, can I replace it with it and still make sense? Yes, you can say it was intriguing. What was intriguing? That we lost the debate. You can say like it was intriguing that we lost the debate. Whether that will be complementing the adjective intriguing. Okay, so that is the structure. That we lost the debate was intriguing. And we say that our verb is was. Therefore, that we lost the debate is our subject. And the subject is a clause. And the subject position is occupied by nouns. And we have said that clauses that occupy noun positions, because they have nominated themselves to do the work of nouns, are called nominal clauses. And this particular one is introduced by the subordinate conjunction that. Don't you forget that.
I hope you have followed me very well. This is not something that should beat you. Always think about identifying your verb. The structure is underlined. That could have scored a go alone cannot make complete sense. Okay, then what has happened was not a surprise. The whole structure is a clause because there's a finite verb and a subject. And you see another verb. Okay, so you have two verbs there, scored and was. Which one is the main verb? Is was. The scored is in the clause, which is functioning as a sentence element, in this case, as the subject of the verb was. And when you have that subordinate conjunction that begin a structure like that, then you know that you have a nominal clause. A nominal clause. Why? Because it's performing the functions that nouns perform, and this one is the subject. Great. Let's go ahead and see what we can have. That we shall get a pay rise is untrue. That we shall get a pay rise is untrue. We can say that it is untrue that we shall get a pay rise. And that, that we focus that part. That we shall get a pay rise. The whole of that can be it is untrue. As I've said. So how many verbs are there? Shall get and then is. But the shall get is in the clause. Our subject is we, and then our verb is shall get. And we have a subordinate conjunction here. Therefore, that is the subject of the verb is. And when you have a clause which is at the subject position, we say it is called what? A nominal clause. Another name is a noun clause. So don't confuse it with a noun phrase. A noun phrase does not have a, a verb like that which we have here. It, we can have a noun phrase which is complex, can have a relative clause in it. But what we are looking at is the clause which has that as the subordinate conjunction and then you have your subject and your verb and it's at a position that is occupied by nouns okay great so we look we've looked at the noun clause as any group of words with a subject and a verb or a subject and a final verb that occupies the position usually occupied by nouns. That is the subject position or the object position. So let's look at this. We have some more examples. We still have what is a clause. Don't forget that's our guiding principle. A clause has a subject and a verb, a finite verb. So that structure that performs the functions of nouns are referred to as nominal clauses. So let's look at that. I've said that. That could have scored a go, that is a nominal clause. So if it's underlined, you write nominal clause. Okay, nominal clause. Why? Because the verb is was, and the whole of this structure is a subject. Okay, don't forget that. This is our verb, and it's finite, is. That's the, the verb to be, the form of be, which is past is was, singular. So was is finite. And then we have our next one, which is Na said that she would be here with us. Na said that she would be here with us. We have seen that that. Great. And we said that we can test. Is it a clause? Yes. Why? Because would be is our verb. And she is a subject. Therefore, this is a clause. Okay? But it comes after the verb said. So we have said that if indeed. 
is a clause and it comes after some verbs. We try and see if we can replace it with it. Okay, so we can say that now said it. Therefore, the whole of this is the object and said is our verb. And since said is our verb, now is the subject. So you notice that the whole sentence element, which is object, is a clause. And object positions, as we have said, are occupied by nouns. And this structure, which is occupying the position that is occupied by a noun, or the function that is performed by a noun in a sentence such as object, this structure is a nominal clause. It is a clause because it has a subject and a finite verb, where the subject is she and the finite verb is the would. But the verb phrases would be. Great. Let's look at the next one. I know that she is an experienced lawyer. I know that she is an experienced lawyer. So that she is an experienced lawyer. Our verb is no. I is our subject. That she is an experienced lawyer is a sentence element. And it comes after the verb no. Can you replace it with it? Yes. Then you say, I know it. What is that it? What do you know? Oh, that she is an experienced lawyer. That is, is a verb. And then she is the subject. The subordinate conjunction is that. It's a dependent clause. It cannot stand on its own. That is one thing we must also know, that the noun or the nominal clause is a dependent clause. We have learned that before. The dependent clause is a group of words that has a subject and a finite verb, but cannot stand alone. It requires what we call the independent clause to make sense. So when you see that she's an experienced lawyer alone, you will not get any sense. You say, mm hmm what are you saying? But if you say, I know, then I add that she's an experienced lawyer, then the sentence becomes complete. That part which we add to I know, and he said the whole of that can be replaced with it. It can be replaced with it because it is a noun. It is doing the work that nouns do, but we don't have any element there upon which we would depend to get our pronoun. Therefore, that whole that she's an experienced lawyer can be seen as an idea or something said, so we can, or something known, so we can replace it with it and you say, I know it. Okay, so when you see a clause that can be replaced with it by this, because it is a pronoun, we call that one a nominal clause. So this is also a nominal clause. That is an experienced lawyer. And it's the object of the verb no. Great. Let's go to the next one. The truth is that I don't, I think this one I don't have. It's have. The truth is that I don't have the wherewithal for this task. The truth is that I don't have the wherewithal for this task. Where is our verb? Okay, once that, that cannot stand on its own, our verb is is. And the subject is the truth. Then that, I don't have the wherewithal. That is the truth. The verb we have seen here, we call the Lincoln verb. Okay, therefore, it is linking the truth to that I know I don't have the wherewithal for this task. Truth is linked. The verbs to be is, am, um, the past form is was, if you remember. And we have some verbs like appear, appear, seem become, uh, we have said that they are called linking verbs. We have are to, and then the plural past is where. All of these can be seen as linking verbs, but 
the verb to be is, am, was, are, were, are many times seen as the ones we use are copula verbs. They link two ideas. So the truth is that I don't have the word with all. So they share the same position. That I don't have the word with all is the truth. You can interchange positions. So when this is linked, one part is linked to the other by a copula verb, this structure, which we know is a noun clause because it begins with that and it can be replaced with it. The truth is it. But because it is linked or it is the same as the truth, we call that one complement. Because the verb is a linking verb. So complements come after linking verbs. And as I've listed, you have am, um, like ajoa is a girl, you know. Let me write that example so that we will see. Ajoa is a girl. In this one, you have the is here. It's linking Ajoa to this identity, a girl. Okay, so Ajoa is a girl. And that Ajoa, because it's, it's a verb, Ajoa is my subject, and a girl is the complement, the identity of Ajoa. Do we get that? In the same way, the truth is, it refers to that I don't have the word with all. So the truth is that I don't have the word with all for this. Our word with all is the skill or the resources or the money. You don't have it. So that's it. So we have our is as our verb, subject, the truth, and complement that I don't have the word with all for this task. Let's look at these ones. We still can also think about a nominal clause that is introduced by the WH word. So that is called the WH nominal or noun clause. Let's look at them. So I have some examples. We still have our clause as a group of words that has a subject and a final verb. That is our guiding principle. Don't forget that. So let's see this. A WH word is there. What you are saying, what is a WH word? You are saying, is there a verb? Yes, there are verbs. We have are and saying. Are is the auxiliary verb and saying is the lexical verb, it's the main verb. Okay, so you, because this is the verb phrase or the verb, then you have your subject here. This is the subordinate conjunction, the interrogator, okay, sound interrogates, I use, usually use them to ask questions, but we are looking at it as an, as a subordinator. So it indicates this idea of what you are saying, the WH nominal clause. So here our verb is, is, and therefore the whole of this, what you are saying, will be the subject, and you are right, refers back to it, it's an ad adjective, so it becomes a complement because it's, it's a copula, it's linking what you are saying and then the idea, the, the, the quality of what you are saying, which is right, right? So you have subject, verb, and complement, sorry, it's complement, not object. Subject, verb, complement, because that's the quality of what you are saying. But in what you are saying, we also have subject and verb phrase. And that is what makes that structure a clause. And we have said that we can also have it replaced with the pronoun, because there's no word there that we would depend on. Because with noun phrases, you remember we said that noun phrase was a group of words or it's a group of words which has a noun as its head. This one, we don't have any noun as the head. But the whole of what you said, something, that something can be replaced with the pronoun it. And so we can say it is right. And when you have a structure like that, that you can replace with the pronoun it. And there's a, a verb which is finite and a subject. Then you have a clause. And because you can replace it with the pronoun it, then it is a noun 
or a nominal clause. And nominal clauses, we have said, play the functions that nouns play. In this sense, it is at the subject position. So it is the subject of the verb is. Have we seen that? Great. Let's go to the next sentence. I think I have to clean this quickly so we can get a proper view of what we are doing. So we have we have this. I know why they lost the march. The verb know is there. So we will be talking about some verbs too. Okay, the verb know is I know why they lost the march. So we have our WH nominal, it's beginning the structure. Why they lost the march alone will not be able to stand and make sense. So it's part of the larger structure, but it's a sentence element. So let's see. Our verb is, main verb is no. There's another verb, lost, which is part of the clause, is in the clause. So we have a verb here, and this is our subject. The whole of this underlined is a, it's a sentence element. So we have our subject here. I know. And because we say it is a nominal clause, a WH nominal clause, you can replace it with it and say, I know it. But what? I know it. If you told somebody, I know it, the person will ask you, what do you know? So, oh, why they lost their march. Okay, so that structure, because you can replace it with it, and it has a subject and a finite verb, is a nominal clause. Let's look at the other example. The teacher understands what is happening. The teacher understands what is happening. What is happening is our WH nominal clause. There is a verb here. Our subject is the what? So we have that. But we have our main verb, which is understands. The teacher understands. And what is happening can be pleased with what? It. Then therefore this is object. Now our teacher is the subject. So we say the teacher understands what is happening. What is happening? A nominal clause. Begins the WH word. There's a verb in it. The verb is finite. Yes, right. Then we have another. She, what she said scared me. What she said scared me. What well, some verbs there we have said which is part of the clause, a sentence element. So our main verb is scared. Okay, and this is the verbs in the clause. And this is our indicator, the interrogator. The whole of that becomes the subject of the verb scared. So you have that. And you can replace it with it. Is that you? And so you can say, it scared me. It is a clause. Why? Because there's a finite verb said and the subject she. And it is introduced by the WH word. So we call that one the WH nominal clause. And it is the subject of the verb scared. Don't you forget that. Great. Then we come to This was how the question is solved. This, it maybe I have to, this is how the question is solved. I think that will make more sense. So this is how the question is solved. Okay, this is how the question is solved. The is there is a linking verb. And so that this, the is is my verb. My subject is this. And it's linking it to how the question is solved. So once it is linking it, we have said that when there's a linking verb and you have your nominal clause, which is it, of course you can replace it with it. Why is, why is it a clause? We have our verb here and our subject is the question. Okay, so the whole of this, because it's referring back to this, 
we say we call it a compliment. And what he said here is the subject. Understand what is happening. The teacher understands is the object. This is our verb. This is our subject. Don't you forget that. So once you see that there's a linking verb and it's showing a relationship, it's just linking two ideas, then that nominal clause is a compliment. So let's look at this quickly. Our clause is still there to help us. I'd like you to look at these ones. Say, identify the nominal clause in each of the sentences below and state its function. So I have some nominal clauses for you. I have some sentences. Would you read them quickly? Look at your indicators and identify the nominal clause and state whether it is the subject or the object of the sentence or is the complement. Great, I'm sure you've been able to identify it quickly. What's the nominal clause? I heard what you told my mother. What's the nominal clause? What is your indicator? Or what type of nominal clause is here? Good, the WH nominal. So you have what you told my mother. You just write nominal clause. Okay, because in was it will be underlined in a text for you and yours will be to just identify. So they will ask you what's the grammatical name of the underlying structure and you check, okay, there's a WH where there, can I replace the structure with it? Once I can, then I say it's a nominal clause. So this is a nominal clause. Okay, what is the main clause there? The main verb, head. So that's my main verb. My subject is I. I had it. Okay, had is not a linking verb. So here we have object. So you say that what you told my mother is a nominal clause. You identify it. What is it function? And you say it is the object of the verb head. It is the object of the verb head. That's what you have to write. It is the object of the verb. Of the verb. Then you put it in quotation mark. Head. Head. Okay? Your identification of the structure is one, according to the Y marking scheme and when you state it by telling us exactly what it is doing the structure as in it is the object of the verb you get two marks okay so that's it Evelyn promised that she would study hard Evelyn promised that she would study hard what nominal clause is here good you found that that's the that nominal clause. So we start from that. And our main verb will therefore be promised. So evening is our subject. Then evening promise is not a linking verb. So this is not a complement. It is also object. So you state this one underlined for you that she would study hard is a nominal clause. Okay. Nominal clause. Why is it a nominal clause? Because it has a subordinate conjunction that, and it is part of the main sentence. It's a sentence element. It can be replaced with it. It is a clause because it has would study, but the would is a finite form, right? Don't forget that. And you can replace it with the pronoun it. So evening promised it. What did she promise? Oh, that. She would study hard. Great. Let's see whether we have more examples. I think we have one example. She said that the story was true. She said that the story was true. What's the, the nominal clause is that the story was true. And said is my verb. And she is a subject. There's also a verb here. That's what makes it a clause. Was. 
and then the story is my subject. But the whole of that is the object because said it's not a linking verb. She said it. Okay, so we have it as a nominal clause. What's the function? Then you see it is the object of the verb said. It is the object of the verb said. So you would have to state it. That is what shows that you understand what it is doing in the sentence. It is the object. Object of the verb. You have to state that. Of the verb, then you quote it. Said. Put it in quotation mark, full stop. You have got it. Okay? That gives you your two marks. It is the object of the verb said. Great. Let's see quickly whether we have other ones. So we still have our guiding principle. I heard what you said. Evening said we have identified them already. So that those were our nominal clauses. And then we have stated their functions that the story was true. We have found them. So all these are the nominal clauses and their functions are that they are the object of the verb. The first one is of the verb had, the second one of the verb promised, and the other one is of the verb said. So we have this one quickly. That a Samoyedjan is a great striker is not in doubt. That a Samoyedjan is a great striker. Uh, it's not in doubt. Where's our nominal clause? Great that a Samoyedjan is a great striker. So this is our verb. The whole of that is the subject. You don't suffer at all. So you say the nominal clause is that a Samoyedjan is a great striker. That's why it ends. And our main verb is is. So we say it's the subject of the verb is. It is the subject of the verb is. And it is a nominal clause because it has this can be replaced with the pronoun it. You see, it is not in doubt. Great. Then we have the last one. It seems that he will do it. It seems that he will do it. Where's our nominal clause? Good. That he will do it. And then our verb is seems. Okay. And where's our subject? It. It seems, as we said, this is also a linking verb. It seems like it's equal to it. Okay, so this is a complement. That he would do it. That is a complement. So don't forget that. And our last one when the team will arrive depends on the traffic. When the team will arrive, Depends on the traffic. So we have when the team will arrive. The whole of the structure. And then our main verb is depends. And so this structure is the subject. A nominal clause introduced by the interrogator when. And the verb is depends. So you can say it depends on the traffic. And somebody will ask you what depends on the traffic. You say when the team will arrive. I hope that we have been able to have a wonderful time together. We have said that a clause is a group of words that has a subject and a final verb. We have learned that a final verb of, a, of, of any verb or the final forms are the present and the past forms of the verb. And they can be three when they are lexical verbs. So you can have have has and had or go goes and went don't you forget that and then the nominal clauses as you have said do the thing the, the, or perform the functions that nouns perform such as subject object or complement and that the many times can be replaced with the pronoun it's they are usually introduced by the conjunctions that and the wh words it's been wonderful coming your way. I hope we have learned together. And don't you forget, as always, I love you to bits. My name is Dennis Amuba. We meet some other time. Bye for now.
subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.